All right, we're live. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. We're lucky to have with us Martin Banks from UC Berkeley. Uh, as most of you probably know, Marty uh, was uh, my PhD advisor um, and a pretty darn good one at that. Uh, he started out being interested in uh, the development of the human visual system and did a lot of work uh, on infants. Um, he's probably best known for his work in the early 2000s, um, studying how various cues to environmental properties are combined by the visual system. And the, the most recent body of work has uh, focused on how various different cues to depth um, including binocular disparity, uh, blur, motion, vestibular signals end up uh, being used by the system to figure out the three-dimensional properties of the environment. Um, he's also been doing some work in, in um, industry to, to improve head-mounted displays, uh, help uh, industry understand how 3D movies can be best designed to prevent a discomfort for viewers. And you know he's a, he's just been a, a very central figure in the development of the field over the last I would say twenty or thirty years, forty years I suppose. Um, many honors have come his way, uh, Tillier Award from the Optical Society, um, and was what was it last year, two years ago, Marty uh, was was uh, inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. So uh, induction hasn't happened because we haven't met in two years. I see. Well, it says 2019 on, okay. on the page. No, I, I, it, I'm, I'm joking. There was no official ceremony. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't uh, tap your shoulders with the sword, right? <laughs> right. Anyway, um, I look forward to hearing the presentation today, uh, which is uh, on binocular vision and oculomotor behavior and how they're adapted to the statistics of the natural environment. So thanks for coming and uh, looking forward to hearing all about it. Uh, thank you, Johannes. Um, uh, Johannes has a distinction that he doesn't know about. And that is, I think he's the only student I ever had who was a better basketball player than I was when I was in college. <laughs> uh, Johannes played for Stanford, which is um, a D1 team. That's pretty remarkable. And it was great having Johannes as a student. He's a, he was a wonderful student. Uh, indeed. Uh, so apologies for a little bit of a technical glitch. We had some trouble with screen sharing, so I've got to be in this um, mode because it, it works. Uh, I hope some of you have red, green anaglyph glasses. I'm going to show you some uh, demos that where it'd be useful to have them if, if you do. Uh, of course, there are many cues to depth. Here you can see a variety, texture gradients, uh, size, cues, etc. So it wouldn't be hard for you to know that the upper part of the path is farther than the lower part of the path. But if we do this in stereo, uh, here you'd have the red lens over your left eye if you have glasses. You can see a much more compelling sensation of depth, uh, much more clearly where the, uh, the weeds are, which trees in front of which, et cetera. And here's an image I just simply love because in stereo it really gives you a sense of the the where the light is among these trees and and makes you feel more like you're there uh, this is a series of slides made by a friend of mine john Merritt, who um this is a non-stereoscopic view of some scene in the in the woods and here's the stereo version of it and you can see quite clearly that that there's a, a big drop near the bottom edge of the screen that you simply couldn't see in the non-stereoscopic view. So there's no doubt that stereopsis gives you uh, a, a rich sense of three-dimensionality and sometimes can provide information you just otherwise can't see. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time today talking about what's called the correspondence problem in stereopsis. That is what feature in the left eye um, goes with the corresponding feature in the right eye. If you don't match things up appropriately, uh, you're, you're going to get garbage for the uh, perceived depth structure of the scene. And you might think that's not too big a problem. 
what's the big deal? The big tree in the middle here matched the big tree in the left eye with the big tree in the right eye, same with the rocks, etc. But it becomes more compelling with the random dots stereogram popularized by Bella Ulege. Here, if you have the glasses, you should be able to see a donut coming out of the screen in depth. And there's no obvious features that guide the search for what in the left eye belongs with what in the right eye. Okay, let me define a couple of things. Uh, I wanna be clear about what we mean by binocular disparity. Here we have a viewer looking at a black target. There's a blue target farther and a red target near. The blue target creates what we call uncrossed or far disparity. And the red target uh, causes what we call cross disparity or near disparity. But this is not only dependent on the scene, it's dependent on where you're looking. If we look at the near target, then the former fixation point has an uncrossed disparity. And if we look at the far point, then the former uh, uh, fixation target has a cross disparity. So disparity at the retina is completely dependent on the scene geometry and where you're looking. Here's what I'm gonna to try to cover today. Um, we're gonna to look at what the distribution of disparities are that stimulate the eyes in the central part of the visual field under normal viewing conditions. And to do that, as I said, we need to know where the person is looking and what they're looking at. The data will show uh, comes from people doing natural tasks that are meant to be representative of everyday activities. And this yields a prior distribution of disparity and some interesting statistics about where people look. And then I'll move on to ocular motor behavior. Uh, the, these statistics help us understand a curiosity and saccadic eye movements. And if I have time, I'm gonna tell you about some very recent work where we compare these statistics and natural viewing to those when someone's using a head-mounted display. Uh, here's our, this is version two of our device. We're now on version three. It's a, a mobile wearable device that measures binocular fixations um, encapsulated by the orange rectangle and has a stereo scene camera that looks at the, the scene the person is viewing. Uh, this is all attached to the head. It creates, um, captures images like you see in the left. We compute disparity from those images, etc. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because um, I want to cover the, uh, spend more time on the results. I, here's the one subject, uh, Paul Johnson, who Johannes knows, wearing the device and walking on the Berkeley campus. And uh, for those of you who have been to Berkeley, uh, this video features something that is quite common in Berkeley, and that is that people wear strange stuff and nobody notices. Uh, there's a, some difficult calibration problems in, in registering the camera data with the eye tracking data. Uh, took a while to solve those, but we did. The key is a elaborate calibration procedure that the person is actually on a bite bar, and we uh, present points of light in known positions in three space and capture the where the light lights are with the camera and then where the person's uh, gaze is with the eye tracker and coordinate the two. We're Marty, now up quick, what, what gets done with the uh, points that are occluded from the camera that aren't from the eyes and vice versa? Uh, those are uh, uh, NANs. They, they're just not entered into the data. So we don't ever construct a point that we can't see. Um, we are now up to seven everyday tasks. Some of the data I'm going to show you is from the original four tasks. These are meant to be representative of what of activities people normally engage in. Here's an outdoor walk on the Berkeley campus, uh, making a sandwich in the lower right. We do an indoor walk looking for an office in uh, a campus building. We order coffee and drink it with friends as another task. 
uh, edit a Word document on a computer, a written document off to the side, and they edit what they see on the screen, and play video a video game on a desktop computer. And uh, if you have glasses, now put the, the red lens over the right eye, and this shows some of the reconstructed data we get from the cameras that has embedded in it the fixation. The fixation is the black cross, and uh, everything is in retinal coordinates, so you'll see the scene moving and the cross not moving when I play this video. Uh, to answer the question earlier, the, um, the, not, the NANs, the are the black points in the scene where we don't have any data. And that can happen for two reasons. One is there's no texture there, and the other is that it's occluded from one of the cameras. And you can see it's a relatively infrequent event. Okay, please advance. So here's some of the data we get. This is uh, the distribution of vergences. That's a, how far away people are looking. Uh, far vergences, far distances are on the left, on the horizontal axis, near on the right. The probability of different uh, fixation distances on the vertical axis. Here are four, the four original tasks. And the point is that uh, there's a wide distribution of, of uh, distances that people look, and they're quite task dependent. The make sandwich task, not surprisingly, people tend to look near. The outside walk task, people spend a whole lot of time looking far away, near, near infinity. We wanted some reasonable means to combine data across these tasks. So what we did is uh, use the American Time Use Survey, which shows how people spend their time uh, and how Americans spend their time in, the, in, a, in a normal day. And uh, so this is a huge survey that has hundreds of thousands of people in it. What we did is took our tasks and mapped them onto these activities and weighted our tasks according to how representative they are of, of hours of time people spend doing different things. And that allows us to combine the data into this black curve, the what we call the weighted combination. And again, you can see there's a wide distribution of uh, vergence distances uh, in natural behavior. Now, one interesting question to ask is, is this random? You know, you, you won't be surprised to learn that it's not random, but a way to look at that is to create a somewhat intelligent random fixator that goes out and looks at points in the scenes that people encountered. Uh, and that's represented by the dashed copper line. That would be the distribution of vergence distances if people uh, randomly select dire directions to look with a bias towards the center. And you can see that people look nearer than that by about a factor of two. And so people who not surprisingly, I think, tend to look at near objects when a variety of objects of different distances are available. We also can look at the distribution of, of gaze directions. What, which direction do people look? Each of these panels, the zero, zero point represents looking straight ahead relative to the head. And uh, left is to the left, right is to the right, up is up, down is down. And the uh, density of the color represents the probability of fixations in those directions. So you can see, except for the um, indoor tasks, make sandwich and order coffee, that people tend to look straight ahead, maybe a little bit down. And interestingly, we, we now have a lot more data on this. This um, kind of cross-like pattern emerges more and more as we collect more data, where people tend to look left and right and up and down, but not obliquely. Those are less common events. If I don't get a chance to get to it, uh, the, these data are very different in the HMD environment. 
We can also measure the horizontal disparities, the binocular disparities uh, in different parts of the visual field that, um, that where people have been, um, what they've been exposed to. And this is a video that uh, here shows the field position that we're uh, accessing. This would be about six degrees above the fovea. And you'll see over time that we'll sample lower and lower in the visual field. This is the distribution of disparities we see. Zero would be no disparity. Positive is an uncrossed disparity, a far disparity, and negative is a near or cross disparity. The red line indicates the median disparity. So you can see in this case, most of the disparities the, uh, are uh, uncrossed or far disparities. And that will change as we change position in the visual field. So here we are going down in the visual field. You can see a couple things happen that bias towards uncrossed disparities goes away. The variance decreases. When we pop out in the lower visual field, the bias is now towards a cross disparity, which continues as we go lower into the visual field. For those of you interested in statistics, these uh, distributions are very leptokurtic, meaning they have a strong central tendency and long tails. And that's important in a way because it means if I, if you tell me where, what part of the visual field you're interested in, I can make a pretty good guess as to what the disparity would be because there's always this mass of data uh, near the central tendency. You're gonna see some more plots like this. This is the median disparity as a function of field position uh, over 20 degrees of the visual field. The fovea is in the middle. Um, upper visual field is on top, left visual fields on the left. Blue indicates uncrossed disparity and orange indicates cross disparity. So you can see there's this obvious trend from near disparities, cross disparities, to uncrossed disparities as we go from the lower visual field to the upper visual field. There's also a tendency left and right toward uh, far disparities or uncrossed disparities, but not quite as obvious as the elevation effect. Now, I'd like to relate that to an important aspect of binocular vision called corresponding points and a very closely related concept called the horopter. Corresponding points are pairs of points in the two retinas that have special binocular status. If you pick a point in the left retina, it will have a corresponding point in the right retina that ends up having the best stereo acuity, most likely uh, binocular fusion, uh, most comfort, et cetera. And so stereopsis is kind of based on that structure of these corresponding point pairs. Uh, the search for corresponding correspondence in images begins, we believe, at those pairs and kind of expands out from that. So corresponding points you can think of as in the retina. There's a point in the left eye, corresponds to a point in the right eye. If we project rays out of those points in the retina into the world, where they intersect in the world, if they do intersect, is called the horopter. So this would be the surface in the world that best that, that stimulates those corresponding points. And because of that would be the surface in the world where binocular vision is best, stereo acuity is best, fusion is guaranteed etc. And um, there are mathematical definitions of the horopter and more importantly, physiological experiments to define the physiological horopter. And uh, this shows something I'm going to highlight in more detail in a minute, that uh, above and below fixation, the horopter is pitched top back. So in the upper visual field is farther than where you're looking the lower visual field, it's nearer than where you're looking. And on the left and right, the horopter is kind of flexed on the sides back. Uh, so it's less concave 
than the traditional mathematical definition of the Ropter. Anyway, we carry these things around with us. It's the region of best binocular vision. There, uh, we direct those surfaces uh, to where we need them by making eye movements, looking left and right, looking near and far. So we place those regions of best binocular vision where we need them uh, by executing accurate binocular eye movements. Uh, the horizontal horopter is defined by um, stimulating the left eye with a point, the right eye with a point, and finding where those points need to be in order to be perceived in the same direction. This is a cartoon of how one might go about doing that experiment. You fixate a point, black cross, and flash these little line segments to the left and right eyes and ask the subject whether the green one appeared left or right of the red one. The green one being presented to the left eye, red, red one being presented to the right eye. And um, uh, this has been measured hundreds and hundreds of times and uh, results are uh, very typically like this, where this empirically measured physiological horopter is a little less concave than the mathematical definition of the horopter called the Wieth-Muller circle. Here are just some studies that, that measured it uh, dating back to Helmholtz. We can make the same kind of measurements above and below fixation. Um, here, the person fixates the cross stimulate the left eye, stimulate the right eye, see where we have to present things in order to be, for them to be perceived in the same direction. And it turns out, um, again, this has been measured hundreds of times. As far as I know, everybody shows this. In the upper visual field, those points have to have an uncrossed disparity to be seen in, in the same direction. And in the lower visual field, they have to have a cross disparity to be seen in the same direction. So this raptor, as I said earlier, is pitched top back. Uh, when you have time, do a little experiment on yourself. Take a page of text and look at it so that it's rotated a little bit top back for you. You'll see that seems pretty comfortable. And then do the same rotation, but top forward. And I think you'll see that that is indeed, there's something less comfortable about that. And I would argue that's because the top back pitch uh, places the page in your horopter. So that's the horopter. Now we're going to ask if the horopter is compatible with naturally occurring disparities. That is, is it is this top back pitch consistent with things that occur in the natural world? And if you think about it, it seems like it should be. Uh, we spend time looking at floors, grounds when we're walking. They're clearly pitched top back relative to our line of sight. We spend time looking on top of desks, top of computer keyboards. Uh, we rarely spend time looking at things that are more like a ceiling plane, like looking up underneath something. And so it seems like that top back pitch might have might be a regular occurrence in the natural environment. And indeed it is. Um, this is, I'm plotting here, elevation in the visual field, upper visual field on the right, lower visual field on the left, and uh, horizontal disparity on the vertical axis, zero would be same place in the two eyes. The horopter, the median horopter across 26 people is represented by this dashed yellow line. And you can see the top back pitch I was talking about. It requires a uncrossed disparity in the upper field and crossed in the lower to fall on the horopter. The other lines are 95% confidence intervals on that um, around uh, for the 26 people. The natural scene statistics are represented by the uh, color shading. Uh, darker color is more likely. And the median uh, across from the lower to the, to the upper visual field is shown by the brown dashed line. 
It's not quite as pitched as the Horopter, but it shows the same general trend. And uh, these are 95% uh, uh, intervals for the natural scene data, uh, showing again that it's pretty common that things are cro uncrossed in the upper field and somewhat less common, but still common that they're crossed in the lower field. So there does seem to be a correspondence between the Horopter's pitch and a somewhat similar pitch in the natural environment. If we look at the left and right fields, here we got left field on the left and right field on the right. And again, showing the horopter and natural scene statistics, the median horopter across uh, quite a few people, I can't remember how many, uh, is shown by the dashed yellow line and the natural scene statistic median is shown by the brown dash line. Not a perfect fit, but um, qualitatively similar. So we conclude that the shape and orientation of the Horopter is, is generally consistent with natural disparity statistics. And that's a good thing because it means in the most likely scenes, um, our visual system is adapted to function well for in likely scenes. There has been an interesting observation in visual cortex in both cat and primate. And um, I think many of you know that the first place where the signals from the two eyes come together is in area V1, which is um, five or so synapses from, the, from where the photoreceptors pick up light. And um, here are studies um, that claimed that the, that binocular neurons that are tuned to disparity are more likely to be, uh, to prefer cross disparity than uncross disparity. And you can see that's, well, there's actually five such studies in V1, I only list three here, uh, V2, V3, V4, uh, et cetera. And we wondered about that because in fact, uncrossed disparities are more likely in natural scenes than cross. So we wondered why that would be. So we spent quite a bit of time investigating uh, further these studies. And we were lucky enough to get the data and details on the apparatus from five studies of primate V1. Uh, and again, thanks to these people for uh, putting the effort in to provide the data so we could reanalyze it. The first thing we found is that uh, they sampled the visual field in a very non-uniform way. Now let's just look at the left panel here. This shows um, left and right azimuth on the horizontal axis, up and down elevation on the vertical axis, and each point represents a cell that uh, whose disparity preference was successfully measured. The, all the data except the blue data is in the lower visual field, concentrated near the fovea. Only the Durant study sampled the upper visual field and uh, only the left upper, upper visual field, ironically. A couple points in the, sorry, uh, yeah. A couple points in the right field, but very few. So could it be that this claim that for a cross disparity preference is due to a, a non-uniform sampling of the visual field rather than an actual preference for cross disparity? Marty, is this yeah. a, are these elevations being represented in retinal space or in visual space? Retinal. But, they must um, be retinal, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's retinal. Cool. Positive elevation means lower visual field. Um, yes, and I apologize, uh, folks, for there's been some flipping of signs in some of these graphs. Um, positive elevation in this graph is upper visual field. Negative elevation is lower visual field. Well, then I'm confused. If it was all upper visual field, why would they have found cross disparities? Sorry, I wasn't clear. The 
in, in the graph, the vertical axis, the upper part of it is the upper visual field. The lower part of it is the lower visual field. Okay. The studies that said they observed across disparity preference are Cumming, Gonzalez, Prince, and Salmons. And all their all of their data is in the lower field. So, so what we should be focusing on is the cluster near the origin, but okay, that's that's what Correct. threw me off. So okay. the, only, the only study that did a more reasonable sampling of the visual field is the Durant study. Got it. That's what was drawing my eye. Okay. Yeah. So I was thinking, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that helps. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. I, you know, it's nice when people do that. Okay. So let's look at the uh, disparity preferences now as a function of where in the visual field the cell is. Here we have the left and right visual fields. We wouldn't expect any particular bias for left versus right field. The green histogram is for the left visual field. Uh, whatever color that is, kind of yellow, pukey yellow color is um, for the right visual field. And there's no statistically significant difference between the two. And what's being plotted is, is uh, along the uh, Horizontal axis is the horizontal disparity and the number of cells that prefer different horizontal disparities. So most of these cells prefer uh, things that are slightly crossed or near zero. If we look at the upper and lower fields, uh, ignore the smooth curves for just a minute and look at the histograms you can see there's many more cells uh, from the lower visual field, pink, than there are from the upper visual field, blue. But there's a significant bias between the two. The lower field uh, units have generally crossed disparity preferences, and the upper field units generally have uncrossed disparity preferences. So we think the claim that there's a cross disparity preference in primate area v1 is due to inappropriate sampling of the visual field um, if there are any v1 physiologists here you know that the upper field is a little bit harder to get to uh, with your electrode and so that that's probably why the the bias exists so our claim would be that the primate brain is at least reasonably well set up to have preferences uh, that are consistent with natural scene statistics. Uh, now I'm gonna talk for a minute about ocular motor behavior. And the question is, um, there, there's been a puzzle uh, in that when people look up, it's been known for a while that they tend to diverge. And we, when they look down, they tend to converge. And uh, when they look left and right, they tend to diverge a little bit. So we looked at that, we collected quite a bit of data on how the eyes converge or diverge when people make saccadic eye movements to an eccentric target. In the setup, person looks at a central light, uh, they can see that light in all conditions with both eyes. And then a peripheral light comes up, you'll see sometimes it's up, sometimes down, sometimes left, sometimes right. And in the key condition in the experiment, they can see that light with one eye only. Then we uh, use a binocular eye tracker. We use a cold mirror to uh, separate the light that the tracker can see from the light the, the viewer can see. That's how we get the monocular condition we want, but still are able to record positions of both eyes. And uh, the, the way we do that is there's a little aperture that allows the left eye to see the fixation point, but not to see the other points. And uh, the right eye sees everything. So the importance of the monocular condition is there's no depth information that the viewer has as to how far one of those eccentric lights is. It's just a tiny light in the dark. So we want to know where the eyes end up when you look in those directions. We also ran a binocular condition in which we removed the occluder so both eyes can see everything. 
Okay, I hope that's clear. There's You look at a light, it goes off. Another light comes on. You make a saccadic eye movement to it. And we measure what the two eyes do with a binocular eye tracker. We do it for a whole bunch of different eccentric uh, points. I'm going to concentrate on the uh, vertical ones where they're looking up or down. Uh, here's the one trace of an eye movement over time. Um, the, the circles are where the tracker said the eye was at different times. The brown curve is a fit to those data. We define a start point for the saccade and an end point based on um, velocity and acceleration criteria. And then we estimate the vergence of the eyes. So zero is the starting position where the eyes are converged at the fixation point. Anything up means the eyes diverged over time. Anything down means they converged. So we define a starting position. And then an ending position. Uh, th this is curious. We see this over and over again. It turns out people have seen this in the literature. When you look up, the eyes make this transient vergence before the, 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 the eyes haven't even gotten to the target yet. And then when the eyes get to the target, they remove some of that transient divergence and settle in at the ending vergence. And then this person made on this trial made a corrective vergence after settling in. So we call that the ending vergence. So that's the change in vergence between the start and end position. Marty, at this point, it might be good to interject here with a question from Dave yep. Brainerd. Yeah, um, Dave. He, 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 he wrote, I'm trying to think through the link that connects the distribution of disparities across the visual field and the measurement of perceived direction that underlies the empirical horopter. So I'm guessing the idea has something to do with the idea that estimating direction is noisy. And so a prior about disparity in the world influence that judgment differentially across the visual field. Is that right? If so have you or others elaborated this into a quantitative calculation? Um, I don't, we don't think of it quite that way. I, uh, the way David is thinking of it is very appropriate for the ocular motor stuff in that uh, if you're going to make your, going to make an eye movement, let's say up, uh, it would be useful for the eyes to end up at roughly the right distance of fixation so you don't have to make a corrective movement that would speed up uh, your ability to attain the new target accurately. And uh, so our claim here is going to be that people do follow the statistics in, in these vergence eye movements. They go to the most likely spot that the target is even when they have no depth information from the stimulus. With respect to the horopter, the, the way we think of it is the, the horopter, uh, the measurement of perceived visual direction is just a very accurate way to find the center of this zone of special binocular precision. Uh, it turns out that Stereo acuity is best on the horopter. Uh, binocular fusion is guaranteed on the horopter. Uh, double vision occurs symmetrically when you go behind the horopter and in front. So we just think that this is where binocular vision is tuned to be the best. And um, using perceived direction as a criterion is just a nice, nice, accurate experimental way to find that. People have done it by uh, finding the center of Panem's fusion area to, where fusion is guaranteed and finding the, the region of most accurate stereo acuity and, and, and get the same results. I hope that answers it. Yeah, let's, let's keep on moving. Yes, okay. David is satisfied. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, all right. So let's, um, here is where people are looking up and down. So they're making a saccadic movement to a target of undefined depth up or down, different eccentricities. And what we've plotted here is the a summary 
of um, several subjects, several trials, and the median response they make. So as I showed you before, when people look up, they have this transient divergence, and then they settle in on a divergence posture. So their eyes go outward when they look up. When the target is not as far from the fovea, they they still show that behavior, but it's smaller. And then when the eyes look down, people make a transient convergence and then settle in on a convergent state. And again, I want to I want to emphasize that there's no depth information in the task. The person can see the target with one eye only. So the other eye is just following whatever it thinks it should do. Uh, this is very consistent. Every subject shows this. Um, here's a, another way to show the same thing. Anything to the right is a divergence change. Anything to the left is a convergence change. Zero means the eyes did not change their convergence or divergence. And when we look up, consistently diverging. When we look down, consistently converging. So this is at least qualitatively consistent with the natural scene natural disparity statistics. And again, I'd argue that it's that it's a good thing. It puts the eyes in the most likely uh, distance in that part of the visual field. And uh, this shows, this is a summary of the median vergence change uh, expressed as a distance and diopters. Don't, don't worry about the units. They're will be funny units to non-vision scientists, but it allows us to put things in the same units. And this is the median binocular disparity. So you can see there's at least a clear qualitative correspondence between this vergence behavior at the end of saccades and the median binocular disparity we see from the natural scene statistics. Okay, I could, um, I'm just going to very briefly tell you about, um, uh, we have recently done a study in the natural environment, like I described before, but also uh, with four different video games where people are playing video games in a head mounted display. And um, I'm kind of running out of time. So I'll just point to this one thing, the distribution of gaze directions, people look in, in HMDs is basically straight ahead. And that kind of cross-like pattern we talked about with a wider distribution of gaze directions in the natural environment, we just don't see it when people play uh, video games. And uh, part of that is probably due to the HMD and pro part of it is probably due to the game. Uh, the reason I say part of it's due to the HMD is that the games are actually quite different and we see this behavior in every game. Uh, we also find that the variance of natural disparities of, of, of disparities is um, much greater in the video game environment. Okay, um, that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I want to thank my great collaborators. Uh, Emily Cooper was a grad student. She's now a professor at Berkeley. Uh, Bill Sprague was a grad student, now an engineer at Apple. Ivana Tochik was a postdoc. Uh, and is now at Google. Uh, George Culleras was a postdoc. He's now at the University of Durham. Augustino Gibaldi, uh, a postdoc who is still here, but he just took a job in industry. And uh, Avi Eisenman is currently a graduate student at, at uh, UC Berkeley. And we were supported by these entities. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Um, at this point, uh, there's usually an awkward pause while people try to write out questions that have occurred to them over the course of the uh, of the um, of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's give folks a cup uh, a minute or two to 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 handle their typing. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm curious about. Um, something that was actually that actually popped into my head as a result of the question that David asked. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, so I have two. Um, the first is, 
he was guessing perhaps that the measurement of visual direction was quite noisy and having a prior on um, on what the disparities are likely to be might help improve the accuracy of eventual vergence movements. I, I, because I was in your lab, I, I know that the measurement of visual, using the measurement of visual direction to estimate corresponding points is really quite accurate, not particularly noisy. But it made me wonder about a, a similar issue, but from the other angle, which is that we're pretty good at estimating disparities, assuming they're not massive. And I'm curious whether you've thought about going through the calculation that would tell us how much accuracy improvement would we get from having a prior on disparity over and above the accuracy of the estimates we'd be able to get if we were just using the information in the image at a particular time. So this is not directly addressing where the horopter mm -hmm. should be, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if you've thought about the improvement in performance you would get in disparity estimation having a disparity prior versus not. Yeah, I, I, well, uh, truthful answer is no, I haven't thought about it um, because we've been uh, so focused on this uh, correspondence with the horopter. Right. But um, it, it is indeed the case that if you put your prior in the right place, and uh, I'd argue that uh, our natural disparity statistics tell you where to put it, um, that it it should definitely improve performance um, as long as the scenes you're giving to the viewer are consistent with that prior. Right. What we're worried about in the HMD environment, I, I didn't have time to go through that, but that environment is uh, rather inconsistent with uh, some aspects of fixation behavior and, and the natural disparity statistics. So we're speculating that some of the discomfort that people experience in, in that environment is due to a poor fit mm -hmm. to the statistics that we're used to. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And uh, you and I have talked about this quite a bit, Johannes, but I'll share our discussion. Uh, you know, where does this, where, do, where does this behavior come from? Where, where does the, why does the horopter take the form it does? Why does the ocular motor behavior take the form it does? Is it learned? Is it built in? And, uh, and as you know, uh, we tried to answer that question in a painful study we did and, and never found any ability to, to change the horopter. Um, Cliff Shore has looked at this virgin's behavior and he can he can change it in the course of um, 10 to 15 minutes of training. He can make people converge when they look up and diverge when they look down. So that, that does seem to be quite trainable. But the corresponding points, you know, you and I devoted a, a week of pain to trying to change it correspondence and, and yeah. couldn't. And ridicule from people in the community. Turns out when you're wearing those kinds of glasses, people in Berkeley do notice. Um, <laughs> let's see. So there's another question here. Oh, this one is teed up for you. This is from Takahira Doi. Um, does the degree of the top back pitch of the empirical horopter depend on factors like the species, the experience the animal has had during development? Uh, that's question one. Question two is when the disparity of the saccadic target is available, does target elevation affect the eye movement? Um, yes, that's, I think, all that's there that needs to be. Okay. Uh, great questions. Uh, the species effect. Uh, to my knowledge, we only know about the horopter in in four species, humans, macaques, domestic cats, and the barn owl. Um, you would expect the closer the animal's head is to the ground, that creates a greater gradient of disparity from lower field to upper field. So you might expect um, eye height effect, and that indeed is observed. The um, 
the the way the horopter is measured in the CAD is not direct, so I, I don't want to put huge credence on this. But uh, it looks like the cat's horopter is very pitched. The barn owl lives in a in, in trees in an arboreal environment, and uh, uh, and the evidence is that it has no pitch to its horopter. And so, yes, indeed, there is a correspondence uh, in very limited data. Uh, it'd be nice to do the studies better, uh, but there is a correspondence. And thanks for that question. Uh, we on the ocular motor bit. What I showed you was monocular data. We did collect binocular data, and the same bias is there, it, but it's about half the magnitude. And people always make a corrective movement at the end of the saccad, so they they will still diverge a bit when they look up, realize they they're looking behind the target, and then make a correction, and. Uh, They'll converge a bit when they look down, realize they're looking in front of the target, and then make a corrective movement. So the bias is still there. Uh, it's about half uh, what it is monocularly. Do you know off the top of your head if the uh, quality of the information indicating the target location is improved, whether uh, those biases decrease further? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. So you you have a couple of points sitting there in an otherwise isolated black void, yeah. right? Yeah. And you get them, they view them either monocularly or binocularly. Yeah. Um, you could imagine improving the richness of the visual display oh, to mm -hmm. increase the reliability of the information indicating the, the depth of the target. And yeah. I'm wondering whether or not, um, I guess you haven't looked at that, but I, I, would your expectation be that the biases are further reduced? Yes. Yes. Uh, that that would be my expectation. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a, a rectangular grid, yeah, frontal parallel to you, you've got lots of information that the upper part of the grid is the same distance from you as the lower part. So I I would expect the bias to be reduced. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time in my career, so I probably won't do that study, but someone should do it. Maybe you could do it, Johannes. Um, let's see, David has another question here. Um, are there task dependent perceptual effects in depth perception that reflect the large differences in distribution of disparities across tasks? David, sorry, go ahead. Um, yes, um, if I understand the question, so, um, there are a variety of stereoscopic phenomena that I didn't talk about. Um, one which I find very compelling, if you, if David cares to look it up, is uh, called the Venetian blind effect. Uh, I, I won't try to explain it here, just it, that that's the phrase for the Venetian blind effect. And we can predict um, an asymmetry in that effect very well from the natural disparity statistics. The asymmetry is that you get the Venetian blind effect on objects that are pitched top forward, and you don't get it on objects that are pitched top back unless they're pitched way top back. Um, so that's an example of a perceptual effect that um, is clearly reflective of uh, probably the, the pitch of the horopter. Uh, but I think he was asking about different, the different everyday tasks. And I don't know, David, if you're still here, perhaps you could uh, uh, qualify your question a little bit. Uh, he had in mind differences in depth perception somehow probed when you were, for example, walking versus making a sandwich. The 
Well, um, so I, I didn't have time to talk about this. There are differences across the tasks in the statistics. Uh, you saw some of that in the uh, fixation statistics, no doubt about it. The making sandwich task generates larger disparities. The one, the task that is most consistent with the Horopter is the outdoor walking task. It's just almost a perfect fit. Um, the indoor, more complicated tasks like um, ordering coffee and talking to your friends and making a sandwich uh, generate larger variances of disparities and larger disparities in general. Um, I, uh, people have shown, Colin Blakemore, uh, Sidoroff, Ron Harworth, others, that if you place a target uh, above fixation, let's say, so you're not looking at it, it's above fixation, and have people make a depth discrimination, they do best when the target position is on the horopter, and they do more poorly when the target is behind and in front. So I guess where David is going is there might be some tasks where we're not particularly well set up to, our visual system isn't particularly well set up to um, make fine depth discriminations. And if, if that's where he's headed, uh, that would be true uh, for these uh, fine detail tasks like making a sandwich. Um, notice in those cases, you fixate exactly where you need to fixate. You, you don't, if you're going to look up to the peanut butter jar, you look at it and then make a movement to grab it. Uh, it's not a task where you have to attend to the visual field um, without making an eye movement, like you do when walking along a path. You need to, you know, you fixate one point, you got to see whether there's an obstacle farther or nearer than that. All right. Well, let's see here, folks. We've a little, a few minutes over our 1 p.m. Uh, deadline. If there are any other questions, um, now's your chance. Hmm. And if there aren't any other questions, I suppose now is the time to uh, thank Marty for a terrific talk and for taking the time to meet with us. And um, yeah, looking to see what comes next. Well, uh, th thank you, everyone. Appreciate the, the attention and the chance to talk about our, our, our work.